Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. Today, I'd like to introduce my special guest, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Dr. Zubrin is president of Pioneer Astronautics and also president of the Mars Society. He's the author of many critically acclaimed books, including Mars Direct, How to Live on Mars, and Entering Space. He has appeared on major media, including CNN, BBC, the Discovery Channel, and NPR. Dr. Zubrin joins us today to discuss his newly released book, The Case for Space, an insightful look at how the revolution in spaceflight opens up a future of limitless possibility. Online Coffee Break. Uh, Dr. Subrin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, I tell you, I'm really enjoying your book, The Case for Space. And it's the perfect time for it. Uh, you know, it's an exciting time for spaceflight. Uh, we have witnessed the incredible reusability of rockets for SpaceX. Uh, the commercial crew program is progressing. Um, the administration currently set the goal of going back to the moon in the next five years. And we're fast approaching the 50th anniversary of the Apollo lunar landing, Apollo 11 lunar landing. I'm just wondering, um, can you give us an overview, in your opinion, of your book? Yeah, uh, my book, uh, The Case for Space, um, how the revolution in spaceflight opens up a future of limitless possibility. Yes, love that title. And so that's what it does. It discusses that. First, it talks about the revolution in spaceflight, the entrepreneurial space race that Elon Musk has set off and which is now going on great guns around the world, which already has resulted in a factor of five drop in the cost of space launch and mm -hmm. with more to come. Um, and then what this will make possible in Earth orbit, on the moon, on Mars, asteroids, the outer solar system, and onward to the stars. And then, uh, so that's about the first two thirds of the book discussing those possibilities. And then the final third discusses why this needs to be done and why we must not let this revolution be stopped. Okay, and it goes through a number of reasons, um, only one of which or two uh, are even discussed by most people, okay? The ones that are discussed, uh, but which I add a lot to the discussion of, is for the knowledge, the tremendous knowledge that human expansion to space will uh, bring. Uh, and this is the one area in which NASA has actually been quite successful, uh, but which we can do more. Mm -hmm. uh, second is for our survival, to get control of uh, our solar system environment. I mean, we're not going into space to desert the Earth so that if the Earth is hit by an asteroid, some people will survive. We're going into space to become spacefarers so we can protect the Earth from being hit by asteroids by being able to deflect them out in deep space. Okay, and then there are, there are other reasons for the challenge um, and, and what it will do for our society to embrace challenge instead of declining it. Uh, and then uh, for our freedom and for our future, okay? And the future of others. Uh, and uh, discuss what it implies uh, for the 21st century if we have an open future, if we have a closed future. If we have a closed future, um, there will be, uh, that idea will drive the earth towards war, just as it did in the 20th century. Right. Um, if you think this is all there is, then sooner or later, you're going to have to have it out with the rest of them. <laughs> and for one side or the other, it's better to do it sooner rather than later. Um, and um, so that mindset needs to be broken. Um, and then finally, the grand future that we can create. Um, you know, the most important things you do in your life aren't even for yourselves. They're for posterity. That's what really matters. You can't take it with you, you know. Um, so so what? What? What are, is going to be your effect on the future, which goes on forever? <laughs> Dr. Zuberman, I love your passion. And I, I know your book, The Case for Space, definitely portrays that. But I also love just the practicality of it. You mentioned the reusability. And in the book, you start talking about just in common sense terms, costs and dollars, as far as how we can make um, space flight more affordable, not only for companies, but also for individuals. I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that. All right. Well, the first steps, you know, have been taken uh, and are being pushed further. 
by SpaceX, and they're being followed hot on their trail by Blue Origin and, to some extent, Virgin Galactic. And uh, I happen to know that there are five funded Chinese startups that are getting into this game. Really? And there are undoubtedly others around the world. And uh, now, okay, Musk, both through reusability and also by attacking the cost plus contracting model, has caused um, a, a, a factor of five drop in in the space launch. Literally, I mean, uh, the, the the Falcon 9 can lift uh, a, a payload um, uh, equal, uh, well, to the um, a Delta of, of four heavy at, at you know, one fifth the cost. And the, the, the uh, so uh, there, there you go. Now, uh, now this is gonna result in more satellite launches which will, with an expanded market, that will drive the cost even more down. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, it makes possible new kinds of activities. Um, and the most important one is going to be point-to-point -point travel on Earth. What space is, is an ocean of zero drags surrounding the Earth. You know, people have made money for 3,000 years on the ocean. Okay, some have made it by fishing, that is actually extracting value from the ocean, mm -hmm. but far more money has been made by using the ocean as a low drag medium for travel from point to point, uh, from port to port on Earth. Now, the, the space is a global ocean of zero drag. And with reusable spacecraft, we can talk about uh, uh, rocket planes, if you wish, that travel from anywhere to anywhere on Earth in less than an hour. And, you know, okay, 100 satellite launches or so happened last year. SpaceX got a quarter of them. Potentially, they could get half. They can't get all of them because the, half of them are, are Russian launches and Chinese launches. Right. They're not up for competition. Well, 50 launches, that's not enough to reduce the cost of space launch by, uh, uh, you know, a factor of 100, which is what we're really interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the But... And the cheaper launches will probably double or triple, may have 200 or 300 launches, satellite launches within a couple of years as a result of this. But there are thousands of long distance airplane flights every day. Okay, so now that's the market that will bring about uh, uh, travel to space for the cost of a first class airplane ticket. And what we'll start seeing after that is, okay, so you're going New York to Sydney in 45 minutes, um, but that same uh, craft that can do that can basically stay in orbit. So maybe you take a day trip, uh, you're a day tour uh, around the world, you stay mm -hmm. in space for a few orbits, but you don't want to stay in on a rocket plane for a week in space because that, or the rocket plane owners don't want to keep it in space for a week exactly. because you could be making money by daily flights. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about space hotels, drop you off there. Now Bigelow's business plan starts to make sense. And now orbital labs, orbital industries all become possible. Okay, so that's the first step. Uh, then, okay, there's the moon, and, and now it'll become much cheaper to reach the moon. And, um, and we can talk about lunar development, uh, both scientific and industrial, arrays of telescopes doing interferometry from the moon, um, lunar helium-3. You know, there isn't fusion power now, but one of the results of the entrepreneurial space revolution is it set off an entrepreneurial revolution in fusion power development. A bunch of people looked at Musk's success and then, and then they looked at fusion and said, maybe fusion power is like cheap space launch. Maybe the problem was never really technical. Maybe it was institutional. Mm -hmm. Maybe a privately funded fusion uh, power development company could do the job where the government bureaucracies couldn't. And now we have a whole bunch of fusion startups, and, and I've discussed about five of them in the book, Yes, um, that have gotten half a billion dollars worth of in investment, and they're roaring ahead. You know, now, so that's the moon. Then there's Mars, um, which has got much more materials on it that could be used for resources. So in terms of developing a full-fledged civilization and not just scientific or industrial outposts, Mars is the, 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 the best goal. Um, and we'll get it. And then asteroid development, outer solar system, there's vast supplies of helium-3 in the atmospheres of Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that mm -hmm. could be accessible. Uh, so, you know, why should, you know, our planners in Washington be planning for an energy war with China over the oil in the Persian Gulf 
when there's energy in space that is literally billions of times more plentiful um, that is available to all of us if we just work together. I totally agree with you on that. And one thing that you, you mentioned too, you talk about propulsion, getting us there a little bit quicker. You mentioned some other uh, technologies that uh, we could probably easily implement um, to, to make sort of when we become, I guess, star voyagers and, and, and we want to get to another star, we want to do it in way less than a human lifetime. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the other propulsion technologies that are on the horizon? Well, okay, to be clear, we don't need advanced propulsion to go to the moon. We don't need advanced propulsion to go to Mars. Good point. And we could probably use it, but don't actually need it to get to the asteroids. Now, once you start talking about outer solar system development, we really want advanced propulsion. And certainly to go to the stars, we must have it. Right. And uh, now the most potent um, form of propulsion that is – within the engineer's conceptual toolbox right now would be fusion power. A fusion-powered rocket using helium-3 and deuterium could probably get to about 10% the speed of light. Incredible. Uh, now, there, there, you know, there could be other things, breakthrough physics things that people talk about, but I, I'm not a theoretical physicist. I'm an engineer. I mm-hmm. look at how I can apply the physics that's known. And within known physics, that's what we can do. Um, now, so that gets you to Alpha Centauri in 40 years. Uh, but maybe we could do better than that. I mean, if we're talking about beamed power that could push light sails, then we could go faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, although the energy source to drive those things probably would have to be fusion, um, especially for power stations that are uh, not near the sun but further out to help push it along. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the You know, there's other things. But, uh, you know... I think it is the settlement of Mars in particular, while it's possible with existing propulsion, absolutely, you can get to Mars in six months with existing propulsion, it will drive the development of advanced propulsion in the same way that European settlement of North America drove nautical technology. You know, Columbus crossed the Atlantic in ships that even 50 years later, no one would have attempted to do it in. Right. Because... There weren't Atlantic class ships in Columbus's time because there was no Atlantic trade. But once Western civilization became transatlantic, they developed better ships. They developed three-masted caravels and then clipper ships and then steamboats and ocean liners and ultimately Boeing 747s. And, of course, the airplanes were actually invented by the branch of Western civilization that they had established on the other side of the ocean. Okay. So similarly, the first colonists will go to Mars in probably in chemically propelled spacecraft that takes six months to get there. That's about as long as it took to travel from England to Australia in the 1800s. But their grandchildren will do the trip in two weeks with fusion-powered spacecraft, and they'll listen to the tales of their, uh, uh, of their grandparents with the same kind of wonder that some of us listen to you know, our immigrant grandparents telling of coming across in, in the bilges of tramp steamers and, 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 you know, eating the orange peels thrown into the bilge by the first class customers um, when we <laughs> crossed the ocean in comfort on, on you know, uh, giant airplanes uh, in, in ours. Um, so this is what will drive it. And then the same technologies that make it a, a matter of luxury travel uh, and ease to travel to Mars will make it possible for more adventurous people to travel to Saturn and ultimately to stars. See, I think that's incredible. And you mentioned earlier, and I, I, I love how your book is laid out. The first two thirds of it is how we can explore space. The last third is why we should. And one thing I, I really love how you pointed out that unless we explore a lot of cultures, uh, when once they stopped exploring, they sort of stagnate. I was wondering if you could just tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, uh, I think that uh, civilizations are like individuals. We grow when we challenge ourselves. We stagnate when we do not. Uh, And this is felt most particularly among the spirit of youth, when people are deciding what they're going to do. Uh, Is their goal in life going to be one of of seeking uh, safety and comfort, or is it going to be one of seeking adventure and great deeds? Uh, And when they they lose that that second impulse, the, the culture starts to stagnate and decline. Now, We've seen a positive example demonstrating this in our own country during the Apollo period. When we were going to the moon and we were going to go to Mars after that and the outer solar and all this, okay, the number of science graduates in this country doubled in the 1960s uh, at every level, high school, college, and in fact, it tripled at the PhD level. 
And as soon as the Apollo program was killed in the early 70s, we absolutely flatlined. The, the rise just stopped, okay? Because what? Youth loves adventure. And, the, the, you know, the Apollo program and, and, and its clear sequel were saying to every young person, learn your science and you could be explorer of new worlds. And so out of that, we got millions of scientists and engineers and inventors and technological entrepreneurs. And, and who were, you know, the 40-year-old technological entrepreneurs who created Silicon Valley in the 1990s? They were the 10-year-old little boy mad scientists making robots and rocket fuel in the basement in the 1960s. And, the, 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 and, 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 and if we did it in this day and age, it wouldn't just be little boys, it'd be little boys and girls, because science is much more open than it was at that time. Right. And, and, and the, the, the positive effect uh, would be tremendous. Now, on the other hand, if we retreat from this, if we no longer think of, of this is the sort of thing we're going to do, is oh, it's too risky to fly to space. We'll go to Mars when it's safe. Okay, like it's going to become safe before <laughs> we've been going there a lot of times. Mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, then you're saying to people, you know, uh, okay, you're a smart kid, so you can get a job on Wall Street trading uh, futures. Um, you know, make some money. Uh, <laughs> get a nice house. You know, that's your goal. Okay, there's ways to do that. But if your goal is to do something world historic or to be part of something world historic, you know, well, is society saying to you, welcome aboard, or is it saying go somewhere else? That is such a good point. Well, Dr. Zuberman, I tell you, The Case for Space is an excellent book. I want to congratulate you for it. How can people find out a little bit more about you? Well, uh, about me, uh, <laughs> as a pilot, you know, Wikipedia, but they can find out a lot about the book. And once again, here is the book. It's on Amazon, and there is an extract from the preface there, and you can also look in, well, side, I think. Uh, and there's a number of comments from people who have read the book. Uh, but, uh, of course, the best way to find out what's in the book is buy the book. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Zimmerman, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Online Coffee Break. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Zubrin today. Hope you did too. Again, his book, The Case for Space, is out now. Check it out on Amazon, available in ebook or hardcover. I highly recommend it. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Zubrin, check out our earlier interview with him from last summer at onlinecoffeebreak.com forward slash 40. I want to thank him for joining us today. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today as well. If you'd like to comment on today's episode, just go to our website, onlinecoffeebreak.com. And we'd also love it if you'd follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Online Coffee Break. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share this episode with a friend. And of course, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast application. Thanks again for taking the time to join us today. See you next time. God bless.